life, which is the traditional Catholic doctrine of creation. So what I'm going to do is to set forth for you very briefly the traditional authoritative teaching of the church on the creation of man and the universe. And then I will show you how a challenge was mounted against that beautiful doctrine. I'll show you some of the harm that that challenge has done to the world and to the church. And then I will indicate to you that 21st century natural science has completely refuted that challenge. And at the end, I will try to show why it is so important that we restore the traditional doctrine of creation, which is the foundation of our faith. In just a few days, we will commemorate the apparition, the first apparition of Our Lady in Fatima in 1917. And as you know, Almighty God worked the greatest public miracle since the resurrection of Jesus Christ to show that this message given at Fatima is of fundamental importance. And you know that the Blessed Mother warned us that if people did not repent, Russia would spread its errors throughout the world. But many people do not realize that the fundamental error of Bolshevik communism was evolution. Because evolution attacked the foundations of the Catholic faith. When our Lord Jesus Christ sent the apostles to teach all nations, he said to teach all that he had commanded them. And at the foundation of that all was a very clear doctrine of creation and a very clear history of mankind. I met uh, a few years ago, or maybe a couple of years ago, an engineer who had worked for decades with NASA, the Space Administration in the US. He was a very brilliant scientist. He had studied science and been taught evolution in high school and university, and he had never doubted it. He was an atheist. And then, at a certain point in his life, he began to experience a spiritual affliction which he could not understand and which he could not control. He went to doctors, he went to psychiatrists, nobody could help him. And finally somebody suggested he go to a Catholic priest because they understood about some of these strange things that happen to people from time to time. And so a Catholic priest, in the name of Jesus Christ, delivered him from this spiritual affliction. And being immensely grateful to have been delivered from this bondage to evil, he set about to read every word that he could by and about our Lord Jesus Christ. So he studied the Gospels. And he said as he studied the Gospels, he was amazed because every time our Lord speaks about anything in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, he always speaks of it as something that really happened just the way that it's described. For example, in Mark chapter 10, when our Lord is asked about divorce, he says, in the beginning, it was not so. There was no divorce. He says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Today, most Catholic young people are taught it was after 13.8 billion years that God made them male and female. But that is not what our Lord Jesus Christ said. And this engineer, decided if the one who set me free from evil believed in these things, I better find out what is the truth of the matter. So he went back and he examined all the scientific evidence for evolution. And he came to the conclusion that it was all based on a lot of assumptions which were never articulated, and there wasn't really one scrap of solid scientific evidence for the evolutionary hypothesis. And he has become a great champion of the traditional doctrine of creation. And you know what he said is absolutely true. You go right through the Gospels, you see, for example, when our Lord speaks about Abel, who's the first generation after Adam and Eve, he locates him at the foundation of the world. And whenever the fathers speak about the foundation of the world, 
They're speaking about the beginning of creation, not just the beginning of human history. When our Lord speaks about the flood in the time of Noah, He speaks of it as a global event. The context is He's talking about His second coming, which is an event that will affect every creature on the face of the earth when it occurs. And the only event in history that He can compare it to is the flood in the time of Noah because that also affected every creature on the face of the earth when it happened. When our Lord speaks about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire, He speaks of it as an event that actually happened. And most importantly of all, whenever our Lord worked a miracle, He acted in the same way that He and the Father and the Holy Spirit had acted in the beginning when they created the heavens and the earth and all they contained. A man came to Him whose flesh was eaten away with leprosy. Our Lord said, be healed. And in a split second, all those tissues were regenerated, restored to perfect health. When a man came to Him who had eyes that had never seen, and He said, be healed. In a split second, He had fully functioning eyes. He had a nervous system and a brain that was all wired to be able to process the information from those fully functioning eyes. And when He went to the tomb of Lazarus, a decomposing corpse, and said, come out, in a split second, out came a fully functioning, breathing, healthy human being. And people looked at Him and they said, this is God in the flesh, because all believing Jews believed that God spoke and it was made. He commanded and it stood forth. This was the faith of all the people. And so when our Lord acted as He had acted in creation, people knew this is God in the flesh. We have an advantage as Catholics when it comes to interpreting the Word of God. Because two ecumenical councils have taught us, Trent and Vatican I, that when all the fathers of the church agree on any interpretation of Scripture that pertains to faith or morals, that is definitive. And this is the teaching of all the fathers, no exceptions. Expressed here by St. Isaac the Syrian, the teaching is this, God solely by His good will, suddenly, brought everything from non-being into being, and everything stood before Him in perfection. In fact, if we look at the writings of all the fathers on Genesis 1 to 11 that have been preserved, they all teach off all these points, that God created all the different kinds of creatures immediately by His will, by His fiat, that He created the body of Adam from the slime, the dust of the earth, as a special creation, He infused the soul into that body. He created Eve literally from Adam's side. And when He had finished creating Adam and Eve, He stopped creating new kinds of creatures. Because everything in this universe was created for us in Christ. Even the angels were created to serve us in Christ. And so, when creation was finished, then began what the, some of the doctors call the order of providence. This natural order of things that we see and that we experience. But that did not begin according to all the fathers and doctors until the work of creation was finished. A very important point which we will come back to because evolution denies this. And finally, all the fathers agreed that human death deformity, disease, harmful mutations, birth defects, all of these things could only be the consequence of original sin. None of these things existed in the first created world when it came forth from God's hands. This is the teaching of St. Thomas and all the doctors. And in the Summa, St. Thomas is very clear that the first perfection of the universe was its completeness at its first founding. All the different kinds of creatures existing together, like different notes of a beautiful symphony, and Adam and Eve in the center as the king and queen of the whole created world. St. Thomas articulates this fundamental metaphysical truth which has been denied by modern scientists and neglected by many of our own theologians and philosophers, but it is still the truth. 
He says, in the works of nature, creation does not enter, but is presupposed to the works of nature. In plain English, this means that the work of creation, of bringing different kinds of creatures into existence, ex nihilo, finished with the creation of Adam and Eve as the crown of creation. Therefore, the works of nature that natural scientists can study do not include the creative work of God. The only way we can know how God created everything in the beginning is through His divine revelation. Because as He said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? St. Augustine emphasizes this particular very important point which evolution, when we try to combine it with the Catholic faith, denies that had no one sinned, this creation would have been filled with natures beautiful with, and good without exception. And so the whole idea that God would have used a process that entailed death and deformity and harmful mutations would have been bordering on blasphemy as father, far as every father of the church was concerned. This is why St. Paul in his letter to the Romans chapter 8 says the entire universe is groaning, is in bondage to decay because of the sin of Adam. And the whole universe is groaning in expectation of the revelation of the sons of God. Now, our Lord says in the Gospel that every fact should be established by two or three witnesses, quoting Deuteronomy. And I'm trying to establish the fact of what was the teaching on creation handed down from the apostles. And I have introduced two witnesses, the witness of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and the witness of the unanimous teaching of the fathers but I have just enough time to introduce one other witness, very authoritative, the witness of the sacred liturgy of the church. You could go through any liturgical tradition in the Catholic church, Roman, Armenian, Byzantine, it doesn't matter. They all teach the same doctrine that I have presented here in every detail. But there's another aspect of the sacred liturgy that is equally authoritative, and that is the testimony of the holy icons which were approved and are approved for use in the churches to teach the faith to people who for most of the history of the church have mostly been illiterate. And the Holy Father has explained that even in the time of Jesus, in synagogues in the first century, in many cases there were mosaics of incidents in salvation history and that the people believed that these were not just decorations, that these had a quasi-sacramental quality and they made present the reality of those things that had happened. And the Holy Father explains that this was the understanding that was brought into the church and gave rise to the iconographic tradition. The Seventh Ecumenical Council taught definitively that the holy icons approved for use in the churches teach with the same authority as the Word of God that is proclaimed from the pulpit. And you can go to a Byzantine Catholic Church or to a Russian Orthodox Church in the 21st century where this iconographic tradition has been maintained and you will see exactly the same icons of creation that I'm going to show to you because the truth does not change. And what do you see here? You see the fourth day of creation. You see our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Word through whom all things were made. And you see the sun, the moon, and the stars being put in their places by the divine power. You do not see any natural process here. Here you see the holy icon of the creation of Adam. Could there be any doubt that Adam was specially created in the image and likeness of the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, whose incarnation was foreknown from before the foundation of the world. If we had the respect for the liturgical tradition and the iconographic tradition that the church herself says we should have, I could rest my case right here and we would all have to agree evolution is impossible. It couldn't possibly be reconciled with what we see. 
but we have lost our respect for liturgical tradition, both in the liturgical prayers of the sacred liturgy and in the holy icons. So I must go on. Here you see the fifth day of creation. Can you have any doubt that what is being communicated here is that God spoke into existence all the different kinds of creatures of the sea and creatures of the air? And incidentally, these icons are from a metropolitan cathedral in Monreale, Sicily, made a metropolitan cathedral by the Pope at the end of the 12th century. Many people nowadays object to this type of authoritative testimony. They say, well, of course, Moses and the ancients were ignorant people. They didn't have our advanced science and technology. So, of course, God could not reveal all the intricacies of evolution. But this is completely false, and it's easy to prove that it is. Here is an icon of evolution. This is the icon that is found in all the temples of secularism, which are our natural history museums. It's in our children's textbooks in Catholic schools all over the world. It's, it's in the BBC science documentaries. It's on the, the, the walls of underground stations. Everywhere you go, you will see this icon of evolution. You cannot escape it. And you do not need to be intelligent to understand this. You don't need to know how to read to understand this. You don't need to know any science to understand this. Two and three-year-olds understand this very well. And that's why they are relentlessly bombarded with this image over and over and over again, just as I was growing up. So we come to believe it because we have seen it so many times and nobody dares to question it. So if God had created through an evolutionary process, then on the walls of Monreale Cathedral, we would not see these beautiful mosaics. We would see mosaics of some, a common ancestor of chimps and humans changing into Adam. We'd see beautiful mosaics of reptiles changing into birds and land mammals going back out to sea and becoming whales. The only reason we don't see those things is because the icon of evolution is a myth that was invented by human beings who insisted that everything, the origins of everything in the universe had to be able to be explained in terms of the same kind of natural processes that we experience in this order of things. And that is a philosophical assumption. It is not something that could ever be demonstrated experimentally and it is false. Here you see the beautiful icon of the seventh day of creation. Do you see the harmony there? Do you see that God is resting in His work? He has done a beautiful work for us. He has made a perfectly harmonious, orderly, unbelievably beautiful world for us, and He's resting in it. And this is why the Book of Wisdom says, God did not make death. Nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living, for he fashioned all things that they might have being. And the creatures of the world are wholesome, but by the envy of the devil, death entered the world. Sometimes people say, well, if the, if the devil fell before Adam fell, then you can't say that the world was very good and all in harmony. That is false, because everything in this universe was made for us. In, our, in Christ, in our first parents. And even though Lucifer fell, nothing in this material order could be affected by his fall until Adam fell. Because we were the lords of this universe. Satan had to force us, to tempt us, to seduce us, to fall, and then everything was turned upside down and the decay, the bondage to decay began. And this is why if you follow the development of the doctrine of creation and examine all the magisterial teachings that pertain to it right up till modern, modern times, every authoritative teaching of the church on creation is 100% in harmony with the traditional doctrine that I've presented here. I told you that those beautiful icons were made uh, for Mon Monreale Cathedral, which was made a metropolitan cathedral by the Pope, meaning he knew that those icons were going to teach the people the faith. 
Just one generation after this cathedral was made a metropolitan cathedral by the Pope, Pope Innocent III convened the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, and that produced the most important dogmatic statement on creation in the history of the Catholic Church, that God, creator of all visible and invisible things, of the spiritual and of the corporal, by his own omnipotent power, at once, the Latin word is simul, from the beginning, created each creature from nothing, the spiritual and the corporal. On the back table, we have a study that we have done of how all the foremost commentators in the church interpreted this, what is known as the Firmitaire. And for 600 years, they interpreted it as teaching that God, by his divine power, created all the different kinds of creatures, corporeal and spiritual, and then man as the crowning work of creation, all together. I don't have time to give you but one example, but it's a very authoritative one. St. Lawrence of Brindisi is a doctor of the church. He knew all the biblical languages. He knew the entire Bible by heart. And he was familiar with all the great commentators, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And when he addresses in his commentary on Genesis the question whether the angels might have been created long before the material universe, this is his verdict. He says, no, it cannot be. The Holy Roman Church determined in the Fourth Lateran Council that the angels along with the creatures of the world, that means all the different kinds of creatures of the world, were at once created ex nihilo from the beginning of time. Now this beautiful doctrine communicating to us the goodness of a God who made for us a beautiful, perfectly harmonious world. And then when we messed it up, entered into our misery, took our nature upon himself and suffered and died so that this could all be restored back into something even more beautiful. That gospel had to be attacked by the devil. And the amazing thing is that right in the New Testament, we were warned. St. Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 3, predicts evolution. He absolutely nails the fundamental premise of all evolutionary theory. And it's right in front of you. He says, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. Do you see how that denies the fundamental premise that was embraced by all the fathers and the doctors? They said things have continued more or less as they are from the end of the period of creation. When God had finished his creative work, that's when the order of providence began. So when you understand that, you understand that natural scientists cannot extrapolate from this order of things all the way back to the beginning of creation. They can only extrapolate at best to the end. But St. Peter predicts scoffers are going to arise later on and they're going to deny that there ever was a time when God alone brought things into existence. They're going to say, no, things have always been the same. The same natural order of things that we see today, that's always existed since the moment of the Big Bang they're going to say. But notice what St. Peter goes on to say. He says, these scoffers who will scoff at the Word of God, who will mock the Word of God as it was believed and taught in the church from the beginning, they will have to deliberately deny the fact, not the belief, but the fact that it was by the Word of God that the heavens and the earth existed, were brought into existence. Not by a natural process. And secondly, that the flood in the time of Noah destroyed the first created world. That's why he says, the world that then was perished in the deluge. So there are actually three barriers to man's pride. When we want to look at this order of things and extrapolate all the way back to the beginning, there are three barriers to our pride. Number one, the flood, because that destroyed the world as it was at that time. The world after the flood was very different. Second, the fall, 
because the world before the fall was different from the world after the fall. And finally, the divide between creation and the order of providence. But St. Peter predicts that man will not tolerate these barriers. He will demand that he can figure out the origins of everything using our little pea brain and based on our very limited realm of experience. And here's the fulfillment of St. Peter's prediction. Here is the most important of all the scoffers because he's the one who paves the way for all the ones that follow. Sir Charles Lyell was an attorney, but he was also a geologist. But at a time when geology consisted of taking walks in the country and looking at the rocks and speculating about how they might have formed. They didn't have facilities to do real experimental research in this field. We do today, and it doesn't agree at all with what Lyell and his colleagues believe. They thought that sedimentary rocks formed like this. Sediments settled slowly and gradually, and then bodies of water withdrew, layers hardened, then the same process was repeated, and this took long, long periods of time. And of course, if this were true, then if you looked at a large sedimentary rock formation like the Grand Canyon, you could be quite certain that the layers at the top are much more recent than the ones at the bottom. And then Darwin saw that if you look at the fossils in the sedimentary rocks, they tell a story. They tell a story of life developing from simple beginnings to more complex, from fish to amphibians to reptiles to birds to mammals to man. And so we ended up with the evolutionary hypothesis applied even to human beings. But I want you to mark well that both Lyell and Darwin proposed their hypotheses without any experimental verification whatsoever. Zero. But I'd also like to point out to you that the Blessed Mother came down to earth to refute the hypothesis of human evolution and by extension the whole rotten mess on the very eve of the publication of Origin of Species. In 1858, when she appeared at Lourdes, St. Bernadette asked her, Who are you? And the Blessed Mother said, I am the Immaculate Conception. St. Maximilian Kolbe, reflecting on this, said, Yes, this is true. She is the Immaculate Conception. Because Adam and Eve were created, they were not conceived. And our Lord Jesus Christ is a divine person who assumed the human nature, so we cannot say that he was conceived. Only the Blessed Mother could say, I am the Immaculate Conception. But today our children are being taught that God used an evolutionary process over billions of years, and he evolved the chimpanzee to a certain point, and then two beasts conceived, and God put the soul of Adam into what they conceived. Now if that were true, then our Blessed Mother lied because she should have said, I am, a immac I am an immaculate conception, because if theistic evolution were true, then Adam and Eve were immaculately conceived, because theistic evolutionists admit that they had no sin until the fall occurred, and therefore the Blessed Mother could not have said, I am the immaculate conception, because Adam and Eve had been immaculately conceived before her. The reason why, as Saint Maximilian pointed out, the reason why she could say, I am the Immaculate Conception, is because Adam and Eve were not conceived. They were created. And this relates to a beautiful truth that we've all but completely forgotten. And it's beautifully articulated in the liturgy of Saint Bridget, which has been prayed for 600 years and is still being prayed. If you go to Rome, the Brigitine sisters are the ones with the headgear that looks like a blue motorcycle helmet. And when, look at the beautiful prayer that they pray continually in their liturgy. God's creation of the world and all it contains took place in the instant of his will's expression and with that design and perfection foreseen by him. Yet there remains still uncreated another work of creation which would surpass what he had already done. Mary we may see in God's act of creation an image of your creating. You see, the fathers had this beautiful understanding 
that the universe, when it came forth from God's hands, freed from any kind of deformity or defect, was a type of the Blessed Virgin Mary herself. And when somebody insults our Blessed Mother and says, well, she wasn't conceived without sin, she was just a, a woman like any other, it makes us angry because we don't like anybody to insult our Immaculate Mother. But why do we sit back while people tell us, oh yes, God used death and deformity and disease for hundreds of millions of years to accomplish His handiwork. He filled the world with death and deformity before He finally got around to evolving the body of the first men. And we just sit back and nod our heads. And yet we've just consented to a blasphemy which totally distorts the true image of God who is all good, all loving, and all wise. St. Pius X knew this. He proscribed and condemned the proposition that the concept of the, the concept of Christian doctrine about creation should, could be recast or should be recast because of progress in the sciences. Because do you see, if the work of creation was a different order of things from the natural order, there's nothing that any natural scientist is ever going to find out that could possibly deny the truth of what God did in creation. St. Pius X saw that, and he defended the traditional doctrine that I presented this morning, and he made sure that his priests preached it. That's well documented. Unfortunately, he stemmed the tide, but this man arose and has become to our age what Arius was to the fourth century. In the fourth century, Arianism was taught or tolerated at one time in most of the dioceses of the Catholic Church. And today, theistic evolutionism is taught or tolerated in most of the dioceses of the Catholic Church. And this is the man who, more than any other, is responsible. Now, just as in the days of Arius, many of the people who tolerated his doctrine didn't embrace it in its pure form, same thing today. Very few people actually embrace the pure Tehardian doctrine but they tolerate it nonetheless. And you see, Teilhard goes right to the foundation and he denies any distinction between the work of creation and the work, the natural order of things. Do you see that? It's right there. Creation and development are seen to be constantly fused, combined together. He's saying, there never was a time when God just spoke things into existence. It's always been this natural process, God working through this natural process. It doesn't matter that all the fathers and doctors taught something totally different because evolutionary science has enlightened us. This was the philosophy of the whole German elite. Mengele was typical of the German intellectuals who supported Hitler because they were convinced that evolution was a fact. There are those who are more highly evolved, there are those who are less evolved. And when medical doctors perform experiments on less evolved subjects, they are benefactors of mankind. Because if I put a gypsy in a barrel of freezing cold water and watch how long it takes him to die, I can use that information to assist my more highly evolved Aryan brothers. It's all based on evolution. And we're shocked by it, but how many Christians today, even Christian leaders, see nothing wrong in embryonic stem cell research? And what is that? You take a weak, defenseless, little human being and you experiment, you take it apart, you use its parts to help the stronger. So the fit, the strong, can survive at the expense of the weak. It's no different. It's all based on the same evolutionary mentality. Teilhard, of course, had no doubts. Evolution is an indisputable fact of science, he says. Well, that is, a, that is that funny if it weren't for the deadly consequences of such a ludicrous statement. Margaret Sanger believed in this every bit as much as Teilhard did. She saw that birth control could be the sacrament of evolution because with birth control, governments could force the less fit to stop reproducing. Then only the more highly evolved would, would reproduce. And then we'd get rid of that, don't you love the phrase, dead weight of human waste. 
Don't think these ideas haven't penetrated the church. Let me introduce you to Bishop James McHugh, head of the Family Life Office in my country for the Council of Bishops, responsible for bringing sex education into the Catholic schools in the United States, which has destroyed the innocence of millions of Catholic youth. Notice he is a true believer in evolution. And because he believes that sexuality is the product of evolution, and that human sexuality is not a special creation of God, as all the fathers and doctors believe, he says, we shouldn't get too concerned about people separating conception from the sexual union, because he says, there's no reason to presume that the divine plan does not go far beyond our present scientific speculation and encompass evolutionary breakthroughs that are even beyond our imagination. That's what happens when you lose your faith in what God revealed about how he created man in the universe. Here's another terrible example. And Kinsey's research, in quotation marks, was staple fare for Bishop McHugh's associates in the sex education movement. He's looked to as the great scientist in the field. Kinsey started off, off in a devout Methodist family. How did he lose his faith? He went to high school and was taught evolution, became an atheist, went to Harvard, got a doctorate. He made a very logical inference. He said, we know we've evolved from subhuman primates. We look at these creatures, we see they do a lot of things with each other that we consider abnormal, unnatural, perverted, abominable. But now we've been liberated from all of that because now we know that we came from them. That's natural, that's normal. If it's natural and normal for our cousins, then it's natural and normal for us. It's obvious. And so he got millions of dollars from the Rockefellers to launch the whole science of making perversion normal based on an evolutionary premise. And because of that, based 100% on his evolutionary faith, what do we see? Today we have the fulfillment of his work, we have the perverse, the aberrant, and the abominable sanctioned as natural, normal, and good. And it is 100% based on the evolutionary premise. Take away the evolutionary premise, you have destroyed the scientific pseudo-justification for the whole house of cards. But who dares to do it? To see how bad it can get? This is from a book published by the Catholic Theological Society of America by Reverend Anthony Kosnick. We, thanks to evolution, we know that we can't believe anything in that silly first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. And so if we really want to know what happened, we need to let science verify it for us first. And then when science has verified it, then whatever is left of what was handed down, sure, we'll pick up the pieces. Look at Father, Father Kosnick. He says, at this time, which incidentally was at the height of when most of the sexual abuse was going on in my country, he says, at this time, the behavioral sciences have not identified any sexual expression that can be empirically demonstrated to be of itself, in a culture-free way, detrimental to a full human existence. That, my brothers and sisters, is the fruit of theistic evolution. If evolution had not been accepted by this man and by his colleagues, there would have been no way that he could have found any pseudo-scientific rationale for such an utterly absurd and outrageous statement. And now we come to this. This is a picture of me taken with my father a few years ago. My father was the son of a Baptist minister. He was born in Pontypool. And my father was brought up in a very devout Christian home. But my grandfather took a bigger Baptist church in the north of England, so my father went to university in England. 
And when he went to university, he was enlightened. The professors enlightened him about evolution. Evolution can explain the origins of everything. Science can explain the origins of everything through evolution. We don't need God and all these medieval superstitions. And so my father left the university completely robbed of his faith. He joined the United Nations, became an assistant secretary general co-administrator of the United Nations Development Program. After 25 years, he was knighted by the Queen for his services to humanity. But he could see that all the problems of the world were worse, much worse, than when they started the United Nations. So why was that? Well, he turned to the intellectual elite, the same kind of people who had been there in university to enlighten him about evolution, and they gave him the answer. They said, the reason the United Nations is not making any headway is it's not going to the root of all the world's problems, overpopulation, cut down on the number of people, and then we will solve all the world's problems very easily. So my father accepted to become the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation here in London, held that position for just about a year and died of a heart attack not far from where I'm standing right now. Now I do not have time to explain to you why I am convinced that God gave my father the opportunity to see the truth and to repent before he died and that he went down into the depths of purgatory and started praying for me. That could be a story for another time. But I am quite convinced that thanks to my father's prayers and the prayers of the mystical body of Christ, whom you are and represent, I was baptized, confirmed, and made my first Holy Communion in the Catholic Church two years later at the age of 18 in the Princeton University Chapel back in the US. But after I became a Catholic, I wanted so much to bring all of my extended family back to Christianity and all the way back to the Catholic Church. And eventually I came to the realization that they all believe in evolution as a religion. It explains where they came from, how they got here and where they're going. And unless they could be shown that evolution is a scientific fraud, there would be very little chance of getting them to take seriously the claims of the gospel and of the Catholic Church. So in my 30s, although my wife and I have been blessed with nine living children and didn't have a lot of spare time, I devoted as much time as I could to thoroughly researching this issue from every perspective, theological, philosophical, and scientific. And after about 10 years, I came to the conclusion that there was no solid scientific evidence for this evolutionary hypothesis. It was a classic case of the emperor not having any clothes on and most people being intimidated and afraid to say anything or to question it. In 30 years of my life going to what were considered the best schools in my country, I never heard one question asked about evolution. Not a criticism, I never even heard one question. That is how thoroughly accepted as a religious faith, evolutionism has become in many parts of the world. Thanks be to God, St. Maximilian Kolbe was one who was not fooled by the smoke and mirrors. It breaks my heart to remember that as my father was being robbed of his faith, St. Maximilian Kolbe was saying in print, loud and clear, evolution is a fraud. Now he was able to do this because St. Maximilian was not only a genius in theology and in philosophy, but also in the natural sciences. His professors said that if he had pursued a career in the natural sciences, he would have achieved greatness on the level of Sir Isaac Newton and the greatest scientists who ever lived. And as St. Maximilian says in the statement here, he realized the more that natural scientists learned about the, the design in living things, the more preposterous it became that everything would come about through some kind of random natural process. And he could also see that if one tried to shove God into it by making him responsible for this random natural process, all that did was to deform the image of God. And so in his writings, which as you know were spread all over the world, 
he was refuting evolution at the very time when my father was being robbed of his faith and most Catholic intellectuals were being seduced along the lines of Teilhard de Chardin. But as St. Maximilian said, 21st century natural science does not support the evolutionary hypothesis. On the contrary, it refutes it. On the back table, I have all kinds of materials, and on our two websites, we have all kinds of materials that you can research. I don't expect you to take anything on my say-so, but I hope that you will at least investigate the matter for yourself, because there's a lot at stake. Lyell and his colleagues left out the most important factor in understanding how sedimentary rocks form, and that's moving currents of water. Today, in the 21st century, we have laboratories where scientists can do real experimental science in this field. This is from Colorado State University. We have a DVD in the back that shows how this type of research is done. And what we've learned is that in, in the real world, as opposed in the speculations of Lyell and his colleagues, most sediments are laid down laterally and vertically at the same time because we're dealing with moving currents of water. And isn't it obvious then that if we had a large movement of water and a tremendous amount of sediment deposited in this way and this formation hardened, when Sir Charles Lyell takes a walk in the country a few hundred years later and looks at this, he's going to think, oh my goodness, the, these sediments down here at the bottom, they must be thousands and thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of years older than the ones at the top, when in reality the entire thing was laid down at one time. Uh, one of our scientific advisors in a peer-reviewed uh, journal article examined the Tonto Group, which is a large section of the Grand Canyon, which according to conventional thinking took 13 million years to form. And he shows that based on 21st century sedimentology, experimental science, if you analyze the sediments, it makes sense to understand this as having been formed in a matter of weeks through a, a huge body of water moving across the formation and depositing it laterally and vertically at the same time. Now remember, the tree of life was based on the assumption that Lyellian geology was correct. What if it wasn't? Then the whole tree of life is completely false. Now, you're familiar with Heckel's embryos, where Heckel exaggerated the similarities between the human embryo and the embryos of salamanders, fish, chickens, and others to help us to understand that evolution is true. Sir Julian Huxley, who was the Richard Dawkins of 50 years ago, said, embryology gives the most striking proof of evolution. So when I was being raised and indoctrinated, I was taught this, that the human embryo recapitulates its evolutionary history. And Sir Julian Huxley, the foremost intellectual of his time said that was the best proof for evolution. Well, we're going to see just how good a proof it was. Here's real science. This is real 21st century science based on observation rather than speculation. And I think you'll agree that there's a rather striking difference between Heckel's forgeries on the top and reality. In fact, Gavin De Beer, who was the foremost embryologist of the middle of the 20th century, said this evolutionary concept of embryonic recapitulation retarded scientific progress in his field. Because scientists didn't need to bother to examine the embryos. They already knew why they developed the way they did. It's embryonic recapitulation. So we don't need to really study it in detail. I could prove to you, if I had time, that evolution is the worst thing that ever happened to natural science. It's retarded its progress across the board. But what's really heartbreaking is that in Catholic schools and universities all over the world, the same lies are being taught to our children. I guarantee you, you go around London, you visit the Catholic schools, and you'll find illustrations like this and captions like this. And look what the caption says. This is a 21st century biology textbook. All vertebrates, we're vertebrates of course, start out with an enlarged head region, gill slits, and a tail. This is complete and utter falsehood. Even evolutionists admit, if they know anything about anatomy or embryology, that what are called gill slits never have anything to do with respiration. Zero. They develop into the pharyngeal arches in different parts of the face. 
So why are our children in Catholic schools being told these lies which make them true believers in evolution? We were in Kenya, Dr. Thomas Seiler and I, in January, and we talked to a devout Catholic girl who was, had come out of nursing school. She said, oh yes, we were taught this. In 2011, a Catholic nursing student is being taught this. It's being taught all over the world, and yet it's an utter scientific fraud. But it gets worse. Here's Father Karl Rahner, one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century, and he accepts all of this hook, line, and sinker, just like Teilhard did. No critical evaluation, no attempt to get scientists with alternative views to arrive at some kind of critical analysis. No, he just accepts as a fact that there are biological developments which are pre-human. This is then used by the anti-life forces to justify abortifacient contraception and abortion. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? If the human embryo has to recapitulate its evolutionary history, then if you have a first trimester abortion, then you might just be killing that little thing in the fish stage, or the amphibian stage, or the reptile stage. It surely hasn't gotten to the human stage for a couple of months. It has to go through all that evolutionary history. But this isn't some uh, atheist proclaiming this. This is one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century in the Catholic Church. Now, Pope Pius XII was well aware of the dangers of evolutionary thought. If you read Humani Generis, most of it is negative about evolution from beginning to end. And he says the bishops must teach that Genesis 1 to 11 is history. But he does say, in the only paragraph that you probably ever heard, that Catholic experts should examine the evidence for and against the evolutionary hypothesis. But has he been obeyed? No, he has not been obeyed, and the present Pope knows it. He says that an actual debate between Catholic scientists who defend the evolutionary hypothesis and equally qualified Catholic scientists who reject it has never, ever been held since Humani Generis. The Pope still hasn't been obeyed. But tragically, just as with the Birth Control Commission, once there was a Birth Control Commission to discuss contraception, what happened? All over the world, 90% of theologians and confessors started saying to couples of childbearing age, it's under discussion, it's only a matter of time now before the church will come out, it's fine. You follow your own conscience. And how many marriages were destroyed because of that terrible advice? We have the same situation today. Yes, the overwhelming majority of Catholic scientists and theolo theologians embrace theistic evolution, just as they embrace contraception in 1965. Does that mean that it's true? Does that mean that the Vicar of Christ on Earth is ever going to endorse it? Absolutely not. But we have a responsibility to educate ourselves on this issue, just as our parents' generation had a responsibility, which they failed, to educate themselves about contraception. And this is what is being taught to Catholic students all over the world in Catholic schools and universities, that God used a process of natural selection and mutation to evolve the first human body from a primordial cell. In other words, our God is such a bumbling incompetent that he couldn't just create the different kinds of creatures in their perfection according to their nature. He had to use this process which leaves in its wake a trail of death, deformity, disease, and defects of every kind. This is 21st century genetics in a graph, and it comes right out of Genesis 1 to 11. I have a book on the back table by one of the most famous plant geneticists in the world, Dr. John Sanford. And this is taken from his book, Genetic Entropy, where he shows 21st century genetics has proven that biological evolution is finished because mutation destroys genetic information and even so-called positive mutations, which are very rare, never add new functional information to the genome. So biological evolution is finished. Science has finished it off. But if we go to the Bible and we look at the lifespans of the patriarchs, 
He says this is perfectly in accord with 21st century genetics. Because Adam and Eve start out with a perfect genome. They had no genetic load. They had no genetic mutations. The first generations were almost free of genetic mutations. It's very feasible that they could have lived to six, seven, eight, nine hundred years. But what happens at the time of the flood? Genetic bottleneck. Only four couples are left on Earth, and all the genetic mutations that they've accumulated at that time are fixed in the human population forever. Plus, the environment has experienced a lot of radioactivity during the flood, and the, the, there are a lot of changes that have taken place which very likely make the genome more susceptible to negative influences. So it turns out that Genesis 1 to 11, which Teilhard mocks, and Bishop McHugh mocks, I'm sure, as mythology, turns out to be 100% in accord with 21st century natural science. And evolution is the one that turns out to be the fairy tale for adults. This is why Sir Ernst Chain of this country, Nobel Prize winner in biochemistry, saw and said back in the 70s, evolution is a hypothesis based on no evidence and an irreconcilable with the facts. Direct quotation. What difference does it make? People ask that all the time. What difference does it make as long as I believe that God did it? What difference does it make if he used billions of years of death and negative mutations and deformities as long as I believe that he did it? Well, it makes a world of difference. And St. Thomas explained very well long ago why. Because he says an error about creation is reflected in an error about the Creator. In other words, if we do not teach our children the truth about how God made this world, then we are distorting the image of God in their minds and hearts. And that is what we have done. And that's why our churches are hemorrhaging. Because this is the truth. And our children are being robbed of their patrimony and being taught something truly diabolical as a substitute. They are being taught something that drastically interferes if it does not destroy their simple, childlike, innocent faith in Almighty God. We have to decide as a community who we are going to serve. Is it going to be the God of creation, the living God, the God of life who did not create death, who spoke and they were made, who made a perfectly harmonious universe for man, free from deformity, disease, and negative mutations, who formed Adam as a son of God, who created Eve from sleeping Adam's side as a foreshadowing of the birth of the church from the wounded side of Christ, who placed Adam and Eve over all creatures as king and queen of a perfectly harmonious world marred only by their sin? Or are we going to teach the God, lowercase g, of evolution? The God who allows natural processes over hundreds of millions of years to produce the first cell which evolves into every kind of plant and animal, who allows this process of mutation and natural selection to transform one kind of organism into another, destroying one to make something better, destroying that to make something better, destroying that, so that this is a God who is in love with death. The God who conceived the body of Adam in the womb of an evolved chimpanzee, son of a chimpanzee. Some theistic evolutionists have said Adam could have eaten his parents for dinner, no problem who formed Eve, the body of Eve from Adam's zygote, and who evolved the bodies of the first human beings in a world that he had filled with death, violence, deformity, and disease. As Joshua said to the Hebrews, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the Lord of creation. For thou hast formed me and hast laid thy hand upon me. Thou hast protected me from my mother's womb, I will praise thee, for thou art fearfully magnified. Wonderful are thy works. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.